أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وخاتم النبيين البشير النذير السراج المنير وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين إلى يوم الدين Dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And it's it's a feeling of coziness and comfort to be in the presence of Allah and even though this is technology working itself out but still in your presence so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us unlock some of the meanings that have been buried by centuries of neglect and um, lack of interest Hopefully the time has come when we can reignite our hearts and minds together. It takes a heart and a mind to work together to understand these divine meanings. The last time we were discussing these ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah and we continue to pursue the shifty character of Bani Israel. We spoke about the ayah 78 and 79. The ayah 78, فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا فَوَيْلٌ لَهُمْ مِمَّا كَتَبَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَيْوَيْلٌ لَهُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ I think we covered that uh, quite uh, extensively. I would just add uh, that the ayah, if we were to paraphrase it in the English language, is Bani Israel, in addition to them adding and subtracting from the original text of the revealed Torah, they claim to be the ones who wrote the book on scripture. That's the, the phraseology that probably would fit into today's public mind. And they were thus considered references by people who did not have scripture. And in the geography and the time, that would be the Arabians in the peninsula, in the Arabian Peninsula. And then the ayah that I think we began to discuss the last time around is... Uh, وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَا النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا And we mentioned that there's a difference between the word massa and the word lamasa. These are Quranic words and we should uh, always keep in mind not to um, fumble in understanding uh, these two words. One of the uh, ay ayat in the Qur'an that is probably common knowledge among many of us is, and it's written sometimes on the, uh, on the covers of the uh, mushafs, and that is, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون Many Muslims, I would venture and say the majority of Muslims, understand 
this ayah la yamassuhu illa al-mutahharun to mean la yalmasuhu illa al-mutahharun and uh, if you go back to the uh, clarifications and explanations of these meanings in the last presentation you'd understand that the Quran uh, the physical Quran can be touched uh, by a person who doesn't have wudu. I know that this will strike some people as odd, but the, the reason that it will strike some individuals as odd is because those individuals have not differentiated the difference between the word massa and the word lamasa. Okay, so we will go on. وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا Allah is speaking. Remember, these ayat are being revealed in the Arabian Peninsula in the presence of Bani Israel who had their own history with prophets and scriptures. And this Qur'an is putting them on notice of their historical character, which continues, that same historical character continues to live on throughout these centuries up until this very day. Because they have not, they meaning Bani Israel, have not broken away from their errant ways that are unfolding in front of us as we thoughtfully read through the meanings of this Qur'an. وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَا النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا Say, قُلْ here is to the Prophet and to you and me when we are, uh, if the occasion arises, and we, we realize in the real world today, Banu Israel and everyone in the orbit of Bani Israel, they avoid the bringing up these types of issues. And obviously, if you're doing something wrong, you would want to bury that in the human memory hole. Well, the Qur'an is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not His will to have human experience, especially those human beings uh, who were given the responsibility of moral, and ideological meanings of scripture to just fade away. That's not the will of Allah. We here are to emphasize that these meanings have to come back to life and we have to know the type of people we are dealing with. قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا Okay, do you have some type of uh, agreement substantial agreement with Allah? It's, this is just a question. If this issue ever comes up and anyone who is sort of familiar with the Judaic uh, concept of the, f the, the last life or the final life or the afterlife or the hereafter, Anyone who's familiar with this would know that they don't want to speak about it. But being that they already disclosed, as this Qur'an is telling us, they already disclosed, made it known that the fire 
is not going to uh, is not going to touch them except for a very few days just a short few days ayyaman ma'duda okay you said that the quran allah jalla wa ala is quoting you and that's what you said and this attitude carries on until today where, where they say there is people in this same group of the Judaic faith, they say, no, there is no fire. There's no such thing as hell or suffering in uh, the, life to, the uh, life to come. And we don't want to go into other details that, you know, denying all of this uh, hereafter and some of the odd and weird uh, statements that they have. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting in scriptural record what they said. And so, قُلْ Our response, Allah is telling us, say, and by the way, many times when the word قُلْ in the Qur'an is mentioned, it means this has to be a public statement. It has to be in the public mind. It's not just me talking to another individual, even though that's a small part of it. قُلْ How many times we have in the Qur'an قُلْ قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ آمَنَّا قُلْ and uh, hundreds of times قُلْ and it's the, in the Qur'an this has to be when uh, and it's translated in English as say it's not it's even though a primitive mind would understand it like that I, I'm not denying that that's not part of the meaning it certainly is but when when the word قُلْ this has, is mentioned, this has to be understood that we're not only saying this, we're making this a public statement addressing the public mind in the public square. That's what قُلْ means. But, you know, we don't even have, we the, the, who are in the company of Allah in this book, we don't even have access to... Uh, an, an, amp, uh, an amplifying system, a satellite station, a TV station, a radio station, whatever. We, we don't have access to any of that. Therefore, you don't find, look around in the whole world, look around and see who is bringing the events of the world and connecting them with the understanding of these ayat in the Qur'an. I challenge anyone and everyone out there to bring me a just one, one um, public disseminating information system that is placing the developments of today's world in light of the meanings of the Qur'an. Have you ever heard someone mention to us a clash, For uh, this is an example, a clash between the Palestinians and the Israelis, as it is worded in the mainstream media. Has anyone ever began such a news item with an ayah in the Qur'an? Therefore, by, by which we consolidate the historical character of those who are committed to Allah with those who are not, and the common denominator here is justice, it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, I know this is hard to say, but it's the truth. Let's wake up, look at reality, look at the world as it is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to respond to them in a public and in a manner that everyone can tune into, أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا Have you entered into a, uh, a solemn agreement with Allah? فَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ عَهْدًا So, Allah is telling us, 
here, there's two sentences. Say, go public, announce to the world. That's the first sentence. Have you, Bani Israel, entered into some type of uh, deep-seated agreement with Allah? That's the first sentence. The second sentence we say, فَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ عَهْدَهُ Allah will never backtrack on His agreement. In a, in a sense, this ayah is it's like uh, oriental martial arts. It uses the force of the enemy against the enemy himself. So we, you, we take in this statement, okay, if you have entered into some type of uh, deep-rooted agreement with Allah, then rest assured, we are assuring them that Allah will not backtrack on His agreement. فَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ عَهْدَ The third sentence, أَمْ تَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ or are you, I mean, this is, a, <laughs> this is a very simple way of saying it. Are you placing words in Allah's mouth? Astaghfirullah. Am taquluna ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun? Are you attributing to Allah what you do not know? Bala. مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ we, we spoke about the word kasaba and iktasaba. We, for those who know a little Arabic grammar, iktasaba is... On the with the metric of ifta'ala. Kasaba is fa'ala, iktasaba is ifta'ala. Ifta'ala is to superficially do something or to do something with not within the natural boundaries of whatever act or doing uh, that is involved. Bala مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ We encounter the word بَلَا There are um, positive and negative uh, answer answers. Like in English we say yes and we say no. Yes is uh, an affirmative positive and no is a negative. In, in Arabic we have several words that uh, are used in the positive or the negative sense. And it's all summed up in a v poetry verse. Naam bala ala al jawabi dalla ay ajal jayri wala wa kalla. The two words that we encounter most frequently in the Quran, meaning yes, are. Bala, the same word that is appearing here, and the other word is Naam. And the two words that appear in the Quran meaning no, but with, with a different uh, degree of emphasis, is La and Kalla. So here, without going into uh, you know, uh, one of these Arabic uh, lessons, uh, here we encounter the word bala. And bala is used 
to um, dismiss the negative that is included in a sentence. It annuls the negative. So, if we take an ayah, another ayah in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us when we were in our primordial existence, which we have no recollection of in, in our previous life, except for what Allah is telling us. And this is... So, and that ayah says, Allah is asking, Alastu birabbikum. Qalu bala. So, the, the sentence is like this, Alastu birabbikum. Am I not your sustainer? They... The, the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to, which is us in our very early uh, pre-memory existence, answered, we said, Bala. So what Bala is doing here, it is canceling the negative in the question. What was the question? Am I not your sustainer? When the answer is Bala, we took out the not, so we are saying, yes, you are our sustainer. If had we used the word Naam, both of them, Bala and Naam, mean yes. So, if we were, if the answer would have been Naam, the question was, Alastu bi Rabbikum, am I not your sustainer? Had the answer been instead of Bala, it would have been Naam, then we would have been affirming the negative in the question which would mean you are not our sustainer. Okay, here, Bala. مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ So once again, we encounter the word kasaba. He who has obtained or gained a sayya, a sayya is an, an action of ill will, whatever it may have been in this worldly life, any performance, any work, any labor, any implementation of ill will, that's a sayyi'ah, man kasaba sayyi'atan wa ahatat bihi khati'atuhu and then whoever is obtaining such an act of ill will and that will that is toxic surrounds the person who is responsible for it. وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ It is they who are the أَصْحَاب النار. The word أَصْحَاب is another one of these words that's used very frequently in the Qur'an. Ashab al-Kahf, Ashab al-Jannah, Ashab al-Aika. Many ayat in the Qur'an, they have the word Ashab in it. Ashab is the plural of Sahib. And here, once again, 
we have to, brothers, dear brothers and sisters, please, we are in the presence of Allah and we want to understand Him as thoroughly and as sincerely as we can. And because also the word sahib and ashab and sahaba, these words are used with a historical connotation to them. Um, and there's the in my expl explanation of the root meanings of of the words i refer to the past tense as being the source of the uh, derivative word in in the arabic language so the past tense that many people get confused with is sahiba and sahaba sahiba means you um, go along with sahiba. And so um, the noun from that is used as companion. The other verb is sahaba. And sahaba has the metric of fa'ala which means now uh, two people are joining along with each other. So sahiba is an effort from one to join the other. Sahaba is a common effort of, of two joining up with each other. I'm not trying to be philosophical here. I'm not trying to be semantic. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, uh, in any way confusing anyone. But it is necessary to understand these types of uh, important differences uh, between one word and the other uh, so that... Um, we don't begin to go off on tangents and leave the original text that we have. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying uh, to us, أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They shall be, meaning these types of Bani Israel, who have created for themselves a special status above all other people with all the discrimination, with all the separatism, with all the prejudice, and with all the racism that goes with it. Allah is saying they are the ones who are going to be co-joined with the fire. As if to imply that they what they were doing in this world were uh, flammable acts for which they will reach their final encounter in the fire. أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا the, the following ayah that we have here. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ You will see many times in the Qur'an that there is always this comparison or this contrast between أصحاب النار and أصحاب الجنة. So when Allah is describing Bani Israel as being condemned to the fire because of not, uh, be, uh, this is an act of justice. This, this torment is not resulting from just you know some uh, tit for tat or some revenge. Justice demands that people 
who uh, legalize the obliteration of other people, whether it is through genocide or whether through it's a, a social death of a thousand cuts, as is happening with the population in the colonized Holy Land, the final outcome of this is not, is not a simple one. It's not one that they're going to be dismissing uh, rhetorically just because they have control of the mainstream media and they think they're going to get away with it. No, no, no. We refer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And here, yeah, Allah is putting it in very plain words and language. The opposite of those who are condemned of Bani Israel to the fire are those who are going to be honored in paradise as they're all as the conjoinment that is due to them because of their salihat in this world. Okay. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ This ayah here, the one that we're in, in, embarking on right now, is ayah number 83. Okay, let me read the ayah first. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ This ayah, it, once again, remember we spoke previously when Allah says, وَإِذْ This is another reminder of another time in another episode in the history of Bani Israel. How many وَإِذْ Which means, bear in mind, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ Bani Israel. Here is where Allah is saying, this is the, the solemn pledge of Allah to Bani Israel. Okay, what, what, what are the elements of this solid pledge? لا تعبدون إلا الله you, you don't... You are not compatible with anyone except Allah. Ta'buduna is not the word worship. I have to take issue with all of these translators who uh, destroyed basically the, the meaning of abada and ibada. It means Bani Israel has to conform and to comply and to be compatible only with Allah. لا تعبدون إلا الله And the only one who merits al-ibadah, the only one who deserves al-ibadah, لا معبود بحق سواه The only one is Allah. Why? Because He created everyone from nothing and provided for everyone from scarcity. No one can do this except Allah. That is why in, in our, we owe Allah our hearts and we owe Allah our hands. That is the meaning of ibadah. And uh, later on in, in the first I don't know, a couple of centuries or a few centuries, this meaning took a, a, a turn that reduced its, uh, its total uh, range of um, 
definitions. It doesn't mean just worship. It means all of the effort that comes out of your feelings and comes out of your muscles and comes out of your brains are owed to Allah. You owe it to Allah. لا تعبدون إلا الله وبالوالدين إحسانا Okay, this solemn pledge that Allah took from Bani Israel is a pledge that if they were, if Bani Israel were to dismiss their social ego and their ethnic self-centricism, if they were to dismiss all of that, they would realize that this solemn pledge is embedded in our primor primordial existence. When we were in a, a type of life that we don't have any access to before being here, before we are who we are here and now. It runs through that. It runs through our, our God-given state of nature. It runs through the relationship that the prophets had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it runs through Allah's covenant with people of Scripture. There's a continuum in all of this. And that continuum is outlined in the following eight what to do in this ayah. U'budullah, that's number one. You conform and you are secondary to Allah. ihsana, And to be more than forthcoming in an honest way with your parents. Ihsan, we, 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 we encounter the word husnan, ihsanan, and the verbs thereof in the Quran. We ahsinu. We encounter. So, what, what does this word mean? What it means if I was to take the current. Uh, phraseology that is used in our time because phraseologies change with generations. Different combination of words <coughs> are used at different times. And what it means is to go beyond the call of duty. That's what Ihsan means. To go beyond the call of duty. Meaning, if it is required for you to be kind to your parents, that's the minimum requirement. You be kind to your parents. You go beyond the call of duty, beyond being kind to your parents, to becoming super courteous with your parents. To become extremely helpful to your parents. That's وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا So, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَذِي الْقُرْبَى And those who are your relatives, who are related to you, Many times this relationship is defined in blood relationships. Like your, because it began with your parents, Allah's being, go beyond the call of duty towards your parents, your father and mother. 
And now he's telling you also your sisters, your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your uncles, your aunts, etc. This type of family relationship is the qurba and with a um, enhanced understanding the qurba could also be those who are close to you in your spiritual affinity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa dhil qurba wal yatama al yatama orphans the plural of the word yatim al yatama al yatim is used to signify to tell you about an underage individual boy or a girl who are who have not reached the age of puberty the age of responsibility who don't have a father and in some instances who don't have a father and mother but generally speaking whoever doesn't have a father and still let's say is less than it could be 15 years old it could be 18 years old it could be 13 years old whatever whenever one a person reaches the age of maturity then and doesn't have a father is called a yatim. For your information, just expand a little here, learn some things. Uh, in the animal kingdom, when an animal doesn't have a mother, that animal is called yatim. Not like in our human, in our social being societies and communities and families someone who has lost their father and is still very young we call them an orphan so uh, Allah is telling us to be super uh, kind to the orphans waliyatama wal masakin Al Masakin also has a couple of definitions. Uh, I'm not going to go into details here, but it is those who uh, work and are still in need. And Al Masakin is the plural of Miskin. Miskin is one, Masakin is many. Waqulu lin nasi husna. See, we encountered ihsana, to go beyond the call of duty towards your parents and the qurba and the yatama and the masakin. And then here, Allah says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna, Not ihsana, husna. Husna here means if you are speaking, if you are a committed Muslim and you're speaking to others who share your commitment, uh, it it's basically al amr bil ma'ruf and an nahi an al munkar if you are speak and this also extends to those because al ma'ruf and al munkar is something that is self evident to any and every human being in the world regardless of what type of conviction they may have what type of religion they may have what type of ideology they may have A lie, if someone is lying, that's a munkar. Everyone understands this. It doesn't matter what type of uh, mindset you have. Killing an innocent person is a munkar. It, it, whatever mindset you may have, it's understood that it's self-evident. This is a munkar. The same way with al-ma'roof, something that's good. Everyone understands, if you, if you tell the truth, that's a ma'roof. Everyone understands that. If you rescue a person who's drowning from death, that's a ma'roof. Everyone knows that, regardless of what 
persuasion they have. وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنَا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ There's a difference here between just praying and just giving charity when Allah is saying وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ Before I go to this, uh, this needs a little, little more explanation. Before I get to that, at the beginning of the ayah, when we said "Wa idh akhadna mithaq bani Israel," mithaq, the word mithaq is a type. Uh, see, if you use the word contract. Then you get into the business world and you get into the legal mindset. If you use the word covenant, then you get into issues that have to do with religion and with creed and with belief. You see how the English language, just by choosing a particular word, you sort of have to take a turn in one direction or in the other. Unlike the Arabic word, which which would combine different elements, whether they are civic elements or whether they are what they call religious elements. Mithaq is one of those words that combines uh, what is called spiritual and religious on one side with what is called civil or civilian and legal on the other side. So, mithaq here, in this context, means that this type of, let's call it, solemn pledge, this type of solemn pledge that Allah has taken from Bani Israel, means that they'd have to do these eight things that we just mentioned in this ayah. And there's two other things that are going to follow in the in the coming ayah. So altogether, these are ten. We don't call them the Ten Commandments because we don't use the Judeo-Christian biblical language. But a person can certainly look at this ayah and the following ayah and realize that there, there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, in the once again, in the biblical language, is called the Covenant. There are eight, th there are ten things, eight things to do and two things not to do. We'll get to those other two things in the following ayah. But al-mithaq is also used in another ayah, in uh, another surah in the Qur'an in which Allah describes the relationship of husband and wife. And he says concerning the wife, وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Wives, أَخَذْنَ نُونَ النِّسْوَى مِنْكُمْ مِنْ الرِّجَالِ مِنَ الْأَزْوَاجِ From the husbands, مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا This is the most entrenched, the most robust, the most significant mithaq. That's a relationship between husband and wife. And Allah describes this relationship as the wife obtaining from her husband this mithaqan ghaliva. And the, the, uh, uh, some of these ayat, they, they invite certain disciplines, certain thinkers, certain researchers and investigators to look into uh, the feminine nature uh, when a wife gives herself in marriage and wedlock, couples herself with her husband, 
This is described as mithaqan ghalidha. There's another way of understanding this. For those who think politically, and unfortunately Muslims are not trained to think politically, and politics, politics can be very clean. There's a whole world out there that is polluted politics because they operate on the basis of lying and cheating and killing and conspiring and all of this. And I have that nothing to do with the moral politics that is included in human relations as defined by Allah and as taught by His Prophet or Prophets. So, if we use the word walaya, and this is another word in which many Muslims get confused between wilaya and walaya. Walaya with the fatha and the waw, and wilaya with the kasra and the waw. Uh, if we were to move the word mithaq and place it in a political context, it would become walaya. If we were to move the word walaya and place it in a family context, it would be mithaqan ghalidha. And I, I'm not here to go off on a tangent, but just in passing, I would like to say this mithaqan ghalidha does not permit the type of uh, license that gives the husband a free hand in marrying a second, a third, and a fourth wife. It doesn't give the man the license to have a type of temporary marriage. All of this is, has been practiced by Muslims who have not delved into the depths of the meaning of the Qur'an. When Allah describes the relationship between husband and wife as mithaqan ghalidha, and uh, here, just for a moment, I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> I profess up front, I'm not a psychologist. But let's say I'm a very concerned person, just like you and everyone else, of understanding what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. So, if we were to say that a young girl, um, young girl meaning in her teens or in her 20s, is in the custody, uh, in the family care of her parents, of her father, then comes a time when she's going to get married. So, the walaya of her father over her becomes the mithaqan ghalidhan of her husband's relationship to her. And I'm not, not only am I not a psychologist, but I'm also not feminine, meaning that I'm not a lady. So, these types of ayat would invite the input of our Muslim sisters who put their hearts and minds together in this Qur'an to explain to us, I mean, is it, is it correct to say that when a father enters a room in which his own daughter, this is his mahram daughter, and she covers herself, and that's her father, the one who has this custodianship over her, the guardianship of his own daughter, the care, the fatherly, the parental responsibility towards his own daughter. And when she's in the privacy of her own room and he happens to be looking for something, opens the door, and she doesn't have her clothes on, she immediately 
covers herself, and that's her father. Contrast that with a husband. If this same daughter now leaves her parental nest, her father and mother's home, and becomes a wife to her husband, and her husband does the same thing. She's in the privacy of her own self in her own room or wherever, and then he opens the door, she comes in. Is the same uh, spontaneous feeling and response exemplified uh, by the wife, in this case, towards her husband, as compared to when she was living in her parents' home when her father entered in on her? These are questions that are uh, that come to mind when a person is reading these types of ayat. أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِي لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ Here we come to what could be a very extended presentation, but I want maybe next time around as I, I see that my time is running uh, short. Iqamatul salah is when a salah becomes a, a public, palpable, uh, manifestation of society. It's not, you know, we're just praying. We're not, we're just going to the masjid and uh, having a few rows of salah or a masjid packed with musalleen and then everyone goes back to their world and the meanings of the salah are just kept in the individual's heart or in the confines of the masjid and these meanings that were just visited in a salah when we go out to the real world these meanings are absent that's when these meanings are absent we we say we don't have iqamat salah but when these meanings that we are reciting and repeating and rehearsing and vocalizing in our homes or in our hearts or in our masajid, if they don't become the fabric of society, we don't have iqamat al-salah. So when we say aqimu salah means this salah with its words and with its voices becomes the fact of life in society. The same thing with ita'i zakah wa'atu zakah. There has to be um, a circulation of money in a systematic manner in which poverty is defeated. But when poverty is all around the place and people are just giving out, you know, a certain percentage of savings and all of this, that's not aqimu as-salah and atu az-zakah. Then Allah says, thumma tawallaytum illa qadilam minkum. And then... After Allah has given you these eight things to do, you turn your backs. You go the other way. Illa qalila minkum, except for a few of you. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accurate? How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very careful not to generalize? Illa qalila minkum wa antum mu'ridun. Inshallah. Uh, next week, uh, I'll try to pick up on some of the further meanings in this ayah and continue with the following ayah, uh, ayah number 84 and, and onwards. And please, from a heart and from a mind, stay with Allah. He is... 
he is the closest that anyone can be from anyone else. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته